we learned in our last presentation in part one that some of the things that led to the collapse of the pagan Roman Empire was Constantine moving the seat of government from Rome to Constantinople. Um, this allowed for barbarians to storm into the empire and to raid the, the pantheon and to desecrate their sanctuary. These, um, these pagan barbarians ended up actually becoming Christians themselves. So as they came in and carved up the empire, they became Christian and their, subs their subsequent states ended up uh, becoming Christian states. In the prophecy of Daniel 2, we have a Roman empire and represented by legs of iron, and then it's divided. There's 10 toes in the feet, and the feet are part iron and part clay, representing churchcraft and statecraft, representing a divided Roman empire, and there's 10 toes because history actually testifies that we can identify 10 principal nations that came up within the Roman empire. Constantine moved his capital from Rome to some obscure place in Thrace, which was Constantinople. That didn't signify um, when the daily was taken away. That was the beginning of the end. The actual end is 508. There were still pagan states up until that point. And in 508, some notable events are able to be seen in history. And one of them is a genocide which takes place in the city of Constantinople. 65,000 uh, fellow Christians are killed. The pretense of this war is actually over the Godhead. Um, so you have Trinitarians murdering people that don't believe in their creed. What's really interesting about this is that Paul says that the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now let us shall let. And we know that that hindrance, hindrance is pagan Rome. And once paganism was no longer the common enemy of the Christian world, then the Christians end up turning on themselves. And remember that the mystery of iniquity is, is the satanic ploy to disguise yourself as a Christian when in reality you're just a pagan. You end up being able to control the religion. You end up being able to subvert the religion and destroy the religion from within. And that was Satan's plan when he couldn't, when he could no longer um, scare people out of being Christians by uh, by persecuting them, um, because martyrdom ended up being uh, seed. The blood of martyrs is seed, as the as the quote goes. Um, and so, the more ruthlessly Satan pursued the policy of persecution, the more the Christian religion grew. And so, what he ended up trying to do, what he ended up doing instead, was he ended up infiltrating the religion. He ended up infiltrating the body of Christ. And this is ultimately Catholicism. And so in 508, once the daily is completely taken out of the way, we start to see signs that that wicked is being revealed. And in Apollos Hale's second advent manual, we have a quote here that says, this first outbreak in the East was followed by a still more important rebellion in which Vitalian, whom Gibbon styles, quote, the champion of the Catholic faith, depopulated Thrace and exterminated 65,000 of his fellow Christians. So that's one piece of evidence. What else was happening in 508? So on this screen here, we have Bishop Remigius, and he's baptizing Clovis. Now the history of France begins with Clovis. So through his baptism, he makes himself an ally of the Catholics, and he becomes their protector. He also um, defeats the Visigoths in 507 through 508. And actually, if you look at the reasons for this war, um, this war was actually fought over theological differences at the foundation of it. And it was Trinitarians versus anti-Trinitarians. So the destiny of Christian theology was also set in the year 508. 
um, Catholics would become supreme in this year. So it was against the Goths, who were anti-Trinitarian, versus the Catholics, um, who were Trinitarian. Franks versus the Goths, Trinitarian versus anti-Trinitarian. The ambassador of Anastasius, who is the emperor of the Eastern Byzantine Roman Empire, conferred on Clovis the insignia and title of Council of Rome and Patrician. Basically, what that means is he's in charge now and he's wearing the purple. So this is for this is the first time a Catholic king of the West became the supreme power in Rome. 508 marks the supremacy of the Catholics in the now divided Roman Empire. Uh, Papal supremacy would begin just a a few short years later, 30 years to be exact. Another thing that is notable that's happening around this time, not in the year 508, but leading up to that point, uh, Clovis is going to marry... Uh, Clotilda, she's a princess, she's a Burgundian princess, and she is from an Aryan realm, uh, but she herself is actually Catholic, so this is a very strategic marriage and alliance, and so we see the shift in the Burgundian realm to Catholicism around this time as well. Now, if you look at this map, it's not a map of 508 per se, but it's very, very close. And you see a divided Roman Empire here. Um, if you look at the pink, um, in the east, you have the Byzantine Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire. And this is a Catholic nation, so they're Christians. Now, the Ostrogoths, they're Aryans, and they're Christians too. And if you look in the south and North Africa, you have the Vandals. They're Christians as well. Um, in Spain, you have Christians as well. Uh, these are the Visigoths, uh, close cousins to the Ostrogoths. Uh, you have the Burgundians, which is between the Frankish and the Italian kingdom. And um, they're Christians as well. And the Franks are Christians. As the leader goes, so does the nation. Clovis was baptized in 508. So you see the whole realm is, is Christian at this time. Um, all the states are Christian. But what about Great Britain? Um, there was Anglo-Saxons that were pagans that were coming in from the north, and they were raiding into, um, into, onto this isle, and they were having much success conquering and looting. Well, what, about, what was going on there in the year 508? Well, if you go to actually Hale's Second Advent Manual, we find some interesting things here. So this is something that the old Adventist used to share as evidence for the taking away of the daily. King Arthur actually is going to come up in the prophecy. Uh, let's read what was going on in the year 508 around this time concerning King Arthur and the Britons. Excuse me, one second. Having succeeded in this enterprise, one of his battles, he directed his course to York, where he is said to have established the Christian worship on the ruins of the pagan. So that's from Rex Encyclopedia on the section of Arthur. That's really interesting. They're crediting Arthur with establishing the Christian worship on the ruins of the pagan. So very similar to Clovis. Point two, that he was the first Christian king and that he was crowned by a Catholic bishop and that his coronation was according to the papal mode in its more mature condition. Arthur was crowned by Dupricius, Archbishop of Caerleon. So we see... Um, the Archbishop of Caerleon, crowning Arthur. We have Bishop Remigius baptizing Clovis. 
On the date of his coronation, there is a difference of opinion among historians. Some place it as late as 516. Others place it in 508. Rappin, who claims to be more exact in the chronology of events in his history, dates them as follows. He mounted the throne of Demonium in 467 at the age of 15. In 476, he was created patrician by Ambrosius. In 508, he was elected monarch of Britain. Interesting. A Catholic king being elected monarch of Britain in 508. Now, Clovis is putting on the purple in 508. This Catholic king in Britain is being elected monarch of Britain. And as the leader goes, so does the nation. So we see Christian states and all the former provinces of the Roman Empire by 508. And it's that date exactly where we don't have any more pagan states. This is truly remarkable fulfillment of Bible prophecy. And we'll prove that fact with the next few slides. Now, this is Miller's experience handling these truths. Notice what he says. From a further study of the scriptures, I concluded that the seven times of Gentile supremacy must commence when the Jews cease to be an independent nation. At the captivity of Manasseh, which the best chronologers assigned to be BC 677, that the 2300 days commenced with the 70 weeks, which the best chronologers dated from BC 457, and that the 1335 days commencing with the taking away of the daily and the setting up of the abomination that make it desolate, see Daniel chapter 12, verse 11, were to be dated from the setting up of the papal supremacy after the taking away of pagan abominations, and which, according to the best historians I could consult, should be reckoned from about 508 AD. Reckoning all these prophetic periods from the several dates assigned by the best chronologers for the events from which they should evidently be reckoned, they would all terminate together about AD 1843. Now on my YouTube channel, if you just type in Andrew Mossman on YouTube, there's a series called The Midnight Cry, where we talk about this movement and the preaching of the first angel's message, which was based on the computation of the prophetic periods. And one of the striking evidences for the soon coming of the Lord about the year 1843 was that the prophetic periods would terminate harmoniously together. So if you go from 508, if you do 1335 years, you have, it takes you to 1844. If you go 1290 years, it takes you to 1798. Two very important um, waymarks in prophetic history and they have other prophetic periods that terminate at both of these waymarks. Here is a really good chart of this. These are the uh, prophetic periods that Miller was talking about in the quotes. You have the seven times from 677, which takes you to 1844. If you do a seven times from when the Northern tribes ceased to be independent, which was in the year 723, according to the best historians, that takes you to 1798 at the time of the end. Um, Let's jump down to the middle of the chart, um, to 508, the middle of the timeline. And if you go from 508, 1290 and 1335, both these prophetic periods commence at 508. All you have to do is do a reading, Daniel chapter 12, and it becomes evident. And they also terminate at these landmarks as well. So you see multiple prophetic periods terminating at, um, on these really important dates. And by the way, um, these aren't all the prophetic periods that exist in the Bible that Miller was preaching. There's even more than this that terminate on these, imper- uh, on these important landmarks. So let's read Daniel chapter 8 now. We're going to read about the taking away of the daily. And out of one of them came forth a little horn. This is Rome, which waxed exceeding great toward the south. That's Egypt and toward the east, Syria, and toward the pleasant land, Palestine. So that's what Rome does. And what is he going to do next? 
and it waxed great. This is Rome still, even to the host of heaven. This is God's people. The easiest way to prove that is read Daniel chapter 8, verse 13, just three verses later, where the host is being trodden underfoot, which we all interpret to be God's people. So it waxed great Rome, even to the host of heaven. These are God's people, and it cast down some of the host and, and of the stars. If the host represents God's people, what would the stars be symbolic of? Well, that must be their leaders to the ground and stamped upon them. First, it would be Jewish. Rome would persecute the Jews before they would persecute the Christians of the following dispensation. Uh, verse 11 Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host. This is Christ. And by, the margin says from, so whichever reading you prefer, you could choose. You could say, and from papal Rome, or and by papal Rome, the daily, uh, which is pagan Rome, was taken away. The first phase gave way to the second phase. And the place of his sanctuary was cast down. We learned in presentation one that this was Rome. Um, and specifically the Pantheon, and by cast down, his capital is moved to Constantinople. Rome is defenseless against barbarians, and Rome is remodeled into Papal Rome. And a host was given him. A host is an army. It's a group of people. Um, where did Papal Rome uh, find their constituents, their base. Where did they come from? Well, they just baptized paganism. They just went for mass conversions. They went for nominal conversions. They weren't concerned about quality. They were concerned about quantity. It was political for them. So the barbarians end up joining the papal Roman side. They get Clovis, for instance, and he helps them conquer the other Christian nations. And a host was given him against the daily, but how? By reason of transgression. This is this idea that they're just going to drape a thin veneer over these pagans. And this is how they were able to defeat pagan Rome. It was by the influence of Christianity more so than by war. And it cast down the truth to the ground and it prospered and practiced and prospered. Then I heard one saint speaking. And another saint, this is Gabriel, said unto that certain saint Christ which spake, how long shall be the vision? This is the vision of Daniel chapter 8. It starts off with a ram. Then there's a goat, which is Greece. Then the kingdom is divided four ways, noted by the four horns. Then out of one of them, another horn comes up, a little horn. This is Rome. But Rome has two phases. And the vision is concerning how long these things are going to happen, the rise and fall of kingdoms. How long shall be the vision concerning the daily desolation and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host, this is God's people that come up again, to be trodden underfoot. And we're going to look now in Matthew 24, uh, verse 15, and we're going to just add uh, more evidence to our case. Christ says in Matthew 24, when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, this is pagan Rome, spoken of by Daniel the prophet. In order to understand that, we need to go to Daniel to understand about this desolating power. He's going to stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Well, the early Christians understood when they saw Cestius in November of 66 A.D., they knew who this abomination of desolation was. They knew it was Rome. And they left the city. Uh, they prayed that their flight wasn't on the Sabbath. They didn't even go back down into their house. They followed the command. They left. They got out of there. And they made haste. And those that did ended up surviving. While those that were keeping the Feast of Tabernacles that were still Judaizing in uh, the city of Jerusalem ended up being surrounded and destroyed. Now, let's go to Daniel chapter 12, verse 13. And from the time that the daily, that's pagan Rome, shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, that's papal Rome. Let's hold on a second. 
let's look at this a little bit more closely. We have in Daniel chapter 12, verse 13, the abomination that maketh desolate referring to papal Rome. But when Christ uses this phrase, abomination of desolation, he's obviously referring to pagan Rome because his command was for those to um, leave Jerusalem when Titus, before Titus would sack the city, right? So we, can, we see that the abomination of desolation can either be referring to pagan Rome or it can be referring to papal Rome. And that's why our pioneers interpreted the daily to be this first abomination of desolation. And they said, if there should be a supplied word put behind after daily, it shouldn't be sacrifice, it should be desolation. And in Daniel chapter eight, verse 13, why don't we go to that? A, a good reading of the text could be, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily desolation and the transgression of desolation. So this desolating power is being joined by the conjunction and to the papal desolation. Rome has two phases as represented on the statue. There's the legs of iron, and then there's also the feet of iron, but clay too. That's the mystery of iniquity there. And notice that there's a prophetic period that's dated from the taking away of the daily, 1,290 years. Now, when Christ was referring to his disciples to explore the book of Daniel in order to understand what this abomination of desolation is, he wanted them to go to the 70-week prophecy. Let's read about it so we can understand why that is. And after three score and two weeks, shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince, this is Satan, that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. That was done through Titus in 70 AD. And the end thereof shall be with a flood. This is a symbol that represents ungodly men, um, ungodly men of war. See Psalms 18 verse 4. And unto the end of the war, desolations, plural, are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. This would be the cross. And for the overspreading of abominations, plural, this would be the pagan and papal, he shall make it desolate even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolator, which is Rome. So we can see that this abomination, that there's it's, it's plural here, and this is representing pagan and papal Rome. Um, pagan Rome would be made desolate. They were persecuting Christians. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. That's what's said actually about the papacy, but the principle still applies to pagan Rome as well. They were persecuting God's people, so they would fall by the hands of other pagans. And then uh, papal Rome comes onto the scene and they too will be destroyed at the consummation when Christ comes back and he will destroy them with the brightness of his coming. I had mentioned in the previous verse and unto the end of the war, desolations are determined and that's plural. Um, I'm not actually implying anything there. Um, I'd have to think about that. Um, why desolations is plural there. But certainly here, when it's speaking of abominations being plural, I, I'm, I feel confident I know what that means. And that's dealing with pagan, the pagan and the papal desolating powers. Um, both of these powers would be overturned for their sins. So here we have Daniel chapter two, we have Nebuchadnezzar's dream, which is symbolically representing the things that we were talking about on the previous slide. We have the daily desolation represented as legs of iron. This is pagan Rome. We have the feet, which still have some iron in them. This is still uh, a Roman empire, but it's a divided Roman empire. These are the various European states. There's 10 principal ones. And how fitting is there that there's 10 toes on the human body? The clay represents churchcraft, and the iron represents statecraft. 
daily just simply means continual. It's used in multiple ways in the Bible. And it just depends on the context, what's being spoken of here. In Daniel chapter 8, it's pretty obvious once you bring all the scriptures together and you study it out deeply and with a lot of effort, then it becomes apparent that the daily is a continual desolation. And that's certainly what pagan Rome was doing to God's people. They were mercilessly and relentlessly persecuting them. You'll also notice that Rome is referred to in code language in prophecy. Uh, let's look at a couple examples of this. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. That's some sort of enigma or riddle. Paul doesn't want to give away who he's talking about in writing. I believe this is because if his letters were intercepted, he would be tried by the power he was speaking of. And perhaps with Christ, it's the same reason. When he therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place. There may have been Romans that were going to hear these prophecies. Um, so perhaps this is a re another reason why he wrote it this way. He said it this way. How long shall be the vision concerning the daily desolation and the transgression of desolation? And perhaps another reason could be that God wants us to dig for truth as for hid treasures. He wants to test our faith. Gabriel explicitly identifies three out of the four kingdoms. The fourth being Rome is a nondescript beast. Rome was an obscure people. Like as it said in Daniel chapter 11, they come up with a small people. So I doubt that Daniel would have ever heard of the Romans at this time. So it wouldn't have made sense um, for him to include Rome by name in the prophecy. Because who are these people after all? But it's very helpful that they didn't know at this time because it keeps Rome obscure. Um, it keeps it in harmony. It keeps um, this prophecy in harmony with how it's being spoken of in Matthew 24 and in 2 Thessalonians as well. I, I find that to be an interesting point. Now let's just read two um, quotes from the testimonies. In early writings, we have, quote, Then I saw in relation to the daily that the word sacrifice was supplied by man's wisdom and does not belong to the text, and that the Lord gave the correct view of it to those who gave the judgment our cry. When union existed before 1844, nearly all were united on the correct view of the daily. But in the confusion since 1844, other views have been embraced, and darkness and confusion have followed. So we have early writings, page 74 on the left-hand side. That's what we just read. Notice that I highlighted in red um, an important word and that the Lord gave the correct view of it to those who gave the judgment our cry. Now, when you go to 21 MR, page 437, Notice this, all the messages given from 1840 to 1844 are to be made forcible now, for there are many people who have lost their bearings. The messages are to go to all the churches. So that undoubtedly would have to include this message on the daily. The Lord gave the correct view of it to them. He gave it to those who gave the judgment hour cry. It's an important prophecy because prophetic periods are dated from the taking away of whatever the daily might be, which is pagan Rome, as we have studied out. And so in order to know how to date these prophetic periods, we need to know when the taking away of the daily is. And the issues that we're having is that when we say that it's not pagan Rome, then it leaves a void and speculation is able to come in. And that's exactly what happens. And people start to speculate what the daily is. And this pushes the prophetic periods into the future after 1844. But since 1844, time is no longer a test 
We have a message stronger than time is. And the Bible says concerning the passing of time, when the, when the mighty angel, which is none less than the person of Christ, opens up the little book, he reads the contents, he gives the interpretation, and he declares that time shall be no longer. So this is not the end of world history. This is not the end of probationary time. But this is the end of prophetic time, which ended in 1844. And we have two prophetic periods, which strengthen this fact. When the daily is paganism, and we know that paganism was taken away in 508 based on the best history. The 1290 ends in 1798 at the time of the end, and the 1335 ends at the passing of time in 1844. So it really strengthens Adventism. It makes a lot of sense, and it gives more credence that the Bible is true and a perfect system of truth, and it strengthens faith, and it needs to go to all the churches. So let's do that. Okay, that's the end of this presentation. God bless to all those that are viewing this.